blessing of a, of a work in Genoa City that when I came along, I was fortunate enough to be born and raised in the grace message. Didn't always appreciate it, but I always heard about Pastor O'Hare and, of course, got to meet later on Pastor Stam and the, uh, you know, the, the great heritage that we have with the gospel of grace. And uh, it's great to have um, such a wonderful message to preach. And whether it was the first century, the 20th century, or the 21st century, the message is still relevant. The, re the message is still shines as a bright light in a dark world, and it needs to shine in us. And it's a real joy to be here this weekend. I uh, just want to say thanks to the folks here for the hospitality this weekend. Say hello to the folks on the Internet, many of our folks that are uh, perhaps watching uh, back, in, back in Ohio. And uh, it's just an op uh, a precious opportunity to be here with you. And it's, uh, it's pretty obvious, I think, that, uh, that the ministry of Grace School of the Bible has grown through the years. Rick does tell the same jokes every year. <laughs> it's, you know, the people that are laughing at it are the people that are hearing it for the first time. When you talk about the light bulb backing into the fan, most of us know what's coming. But anyway, it is a, it's an it's exciting thing. Open up your Bibles to, to 2 Timothy. Let's uh, have some time in the Word this evening as we begin. Let's read 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verses 1 through 7. We'll have a word of prayer and then begin. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in, first in thy grandmother Lois, and in thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance, that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting out of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this weekend. We thank you for the saints who labor here at this assembly to make this weekend possible. We thank you for the ministry of grace through the Bible through the years and the fruit that it's born and for the, uh, the opportunity to gather together around the truths of your word, the message that we preach, and to be together with, with wonderful friends, to be encouraged and to be refreshed. We thank you most of all for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, that we come together not about around religion and tradition, but about the life of our Savior that can live in each and every one of us and ultimately be shared in our world. And we pray that this weekend would be a great encouragement to us as we, as we fellowship together around these things. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy here. This is the very last of, of his epistles as he begins to, to close out his ministry with Timothy. He's announcing to Timothy that uh, at the end of the book that he's ready to be offered. The time of his departure is at hand. And uh, Paul is ready to, to walk off the stage of life. And Timothy is, is going to be following in Paul's footsteps. And, and Timothy is losing a great friend. But Timothy is at a point in his life when he is struggling with some things, and, and Paul evidently is aware of that. And Paul begins the book in a very special way as he, as he opens up his letter to Timothy and is instructing him about the, about the work of the ministry. And Richard has asked me to talk about the two, two things, the two plans of attack that Satan has in the, uh, against the work of the ministry and, the, and the, uh, the Word of God rightly divided. Number one, Satan attacks in two areas. Number one, the message. And number two, the messenger. And here in 2 Timothy, it deals mostly with that second aspect. And so I'm going to deal mostly with that particular part of the, uh, of the passage here because my, my topic is, is it comes out of verse 7, "...for God hath not given us the spirit of fear." Other brethren are going to talk about the, the, the work of faith with power. Brother John and, and also Rick about, the, uh, about the, 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 the sound mind and so on and so things. So it's pretty hard to, to not overlap some of those things, but we're going to cover some of that. The issue of, of the message. 
Timothy has been, been a, a close associate of the Apostle Paul. There's these two areas to watch and maintain the, 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 the loyalty and, the, and the, the, the clinging tenaciously to the message. If you go back to 1 Timothy chapter number 1. 1 Timothy chapter number 1, as he writes the first epistle unto Timothy, he says in 1 Timothy 1, 3, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions, rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. Charges Timothy, teach no other doctrine. We need to be loyal to the message, tenacious with the message, uh, uh, standing uh, without, without compromise for the message. Because the natural tendency is to drift away and to move away from the truth of the message. And it was happening even in Paul's day. He says in verse 5, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and faith unfeigned. By the way, as, I, as he talks about the end of the commandment, the goal of the commandment being charity. As I read that verse, oftentimes comes to my mind the little book of Philemon, the, the, the forgotten epistle, where the, the, the end of the commandment, the doctrine that the, you know, if, if, the, if the doctrine doesn't affect your life, what's the doctrine for? If, if the truth doesn't affect your life? There we see charity. We see the Word of God as, 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 as it's been taken root in, the, in Philemon's life and he's carrying on his ministry. And we see, the, the, we see charity demonstrated out of a pure heart in that relationship with, with Onesimus. And that's the goal of the ministry. And the, the, the truth of His Word, verse 6, "...from which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they are firm." So we need, to, we need to be tenacious for the message, tenacious for the doctrine, and stand for it and, and keep it pure and, and remain true to it. It's, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Guard it, Timothy. Don't let it fall. It's something valuable. It's entrusted with you. It's not just religious tradition, but it's, it's, it's the, the precious deposit, the, 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 the truth of the gospel, the grace of God from, from heaven's glory committed to, to me, and now I'm committing it to you, and it's the, it's the light that shines out of this dark world into the hearts of men and makes known the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and the wisdom of God and the power of God and the, 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 the hidden eternal purpose that is now made known. Is there anything that's of greater value than that? That the sheer value of it as we, as we, as we study it, as we spend time, and this is the conference for the school, as we labor in things in the work of the ministry, learning to understand that truth and first, first have the, the Word of God opened up to us with the key of right division and we see how the Bible fits together and we have the, the questions answered and the harmony that comes in God's Word, but the truth taking us on in to know Jesus Christ and have that, that personal understanding of Him and, and His heartbeat and have the, the, the eternal counsels of God opened up to us and see the eternal purpose that starts in, in eternity past and goes on into eternity future. Maintaining that great truth and the message. And we need to keep it and guard it because we've been entrusted with it. And the tendency is to drift away and to, to move off center. And the first generation embraces the truth and the second generation then has a tendency, yeah, well, I've heard this all my life and... Now, now, I'm just going to, you know, I'm going to tolerate it. There's all this other stuff going on. The second generation often tolerates the truth. And then the third generation snubs the truth because they've, they've, they've succumbed to the, to the lure of the religious system and the pull of the world. And Paul is telling Timothy to fight that good fight of faith and, and to stand truth for the, true for the Word of God and to hold it. So we need to hold fast the doctrine. We need to preach the doctrine. We need to commit the same truth to faithful men that should be able to teach others also what, the, what, what Grace School of the Bible is all about, passing the doctrine on from generation to generation. It's been fascinating for me having grown up into, in it to being, being third generation grace believer. And then as my kids born into our family are our fourth generation and now I've got our first grandson, fifth generation. And watching, you know, I, I, I look back, I didn't always appreciate it at the time, but I saw my parents and grandparents having to, having to pay a great price for the truth. 
And, and I was indifferent to it for many, many years and didn't, didn't appreciate the significance of it as I was going through my teen years and as many of you did and, and looking for things and, and trying to figure out the course of your life and, and so on. But came to a point where I greatly began to appreciate it. But even as I grew up in, a, in an established work and watching other, you know, my, my, uh, uh, my peers, other grace kids, it was fascinating to watch and see tendencies there that I now see were, were taking place. And then as I, as I grew and mature and I'll watch, uh, I've, I've come into my 50s and almost getting, I'm getting ready to turn 60 years old and you watch these people grow up and their kids grow up. It's been fascinating to see how the, how the it's been saddening to see how, how little things and tendencies, you see where mom and dad were and then you see where, where their sons and their daughters were and then you see where the grandchildren are and the departure from the truth. And that's, that, that is so, 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 so much of a struggle as you're facing the, the pull of the world and the, 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 the world system and the religious system. And coming together this weekend is, is, a, is a great opportunity to be refreshed and to be challenged anew. To be, to be zealous for the doctrine and to be zealous for the truth and to, and, to, and to proclaim it. We hold it. We preach it. We seek to commit it to faithful men. We study it. We are to adorn the doctrine. We're to, we're to wear it so that, so that the truth is, is visibly seen as Jesus Christ lives His life out of us. And so there's that, that wonderful challenge in 1 Timothy to, to hold the truth and lay hold on eternal life and keep that which is committed to thy trust because things are, because things are, are deteriorating and some have departed and some have given heed to seducing spirits and some have gone aside, turned aside unto vain jangling. And so Paul is challenging him that way in, in 1 Timothy. But in 2 Timothy, things have deteriorated even further and to the point where now Timothy... Evidently, in, in the passage here, as, is, is growing weary in well-doing. Maybe you're here this evening, growing weary in well-doing as, you, as, you, as you're pressing on in the ministry and the, and the struggles and the pressures of life and, and the things that, that we deal with. I want to talk to you the, the remainder of our time basically about the second half of that. As Paul addresses Timothy, he, is, he has come to a point in his life where, where he is... He is doubting himself and he is, he is uh, wavering maybe to some degree. And Paul recognizes that. He says, being mindful of thy tears. Timothy is, is, is a very emotional uh, individual. He's got a tender heart. He challenges Timothy in verse 8 to be not thou wast therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. There's the message that was committed to him. Or of me, his prisoner. <coughs> the, the relationship that they had. So Timothy is, is, is wavering here. And the issue of our, us as, as, as ministers of the gospel and, and doing the work of the ministry and just your Christian life. I realize there's a lot of people here that, are not, that don't stand behind a pulpit on a regular basis and, and are not, don't have that area. But, but ministry is done not just by the man behind the pulpit. But the saints do the work of the ministry, don't they? The, the work of the ministry is perfecting the saints so that they can go out. The pastor is to be and the, the elder is to be an example of the believers in word and deed and in, in spirit and faith and in purity. If he's to be the example, they're to be doing the same thing in their daily lives as they go out and carry out the work of the ministry. But Timothy here is, is struggling. And so Paul appeals to him in a, in a very special way. He appeals to his mind and his thinking. Um, Paul and Timothy had a very special relationship. Beginning with verse 2, To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul and Timothy were tight. They were, he calls him his dearly beloved son, his beloved son. He says, he calls him in, in Philippians, he says, I have no man like-minded who as a son with the Father serves with me in the gospel. They had been through a great deal thick and thin. He says in 2 Timothy 3, Thou hast fully known my, my life, my manner of life, and the persecutions and the things that we've endured. So, so there's, this, there's an immediately an emotional connection there. And he says, I thank God, verse 3, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears. Timothy had a tender heart. 
Um, uh, he, 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 was, uh, he was raised by two women. He, you know, growing up, he didn't have a strong uh, man figure evidently in his life. Um, his mother and his grandmother ministered to him. Timothy had a, had a tender heart. Paul had a tender heart too. He says over in Acts 20, that serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears. And he says, I cease not to warn you, Ephesians, night and day with tears. Paul had a, had a tender heart too. They were kindred spirits. They were in many ways. They, they, they had, a, they had, a, they had a, a, a bond in ministry. But as Paul takes all that into account, he appeals to Timothy on the basis of his mind and his thinking. He says, uh, uh, first of all, he says, I, I serve God for my forefathers, And without ceasing, I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day. Paul is remembering Timothy and thinking about Timothy, desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith. See, Paul Paul pulls up some things in in Timothy's mind and and, and recollection of of things to get Timothy thinking about his his upbringing and thinking about the ministry that that they shared together. And, and, and with Timothy's tender heart and Paul's tender heart, the, the relationship that they had, to, have a, to have, keep your heart right is a, is a great, great asset. David, while he was, uh, you know, had a lot of problems, it said, the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. Um, he he uh, made a lot of mistakes in his life, but it was, he always would come back to, to dead center and acknowledge those things and, 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 and seek to repair them. To have a good heart is an important thing. But to have a tender heart can also be a liability. Not in the sense that having a, having a tender heart is a liability. But it comes, back, comes to the issue of, of, of your, your emotions and your feelings and, and having a, a sensitivity toward things. And it really can, it, it's not a far step away from, from the issue of human weakness. You know, your emotions, your, 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 your tenderness, your sensitivity to things demonstrate some things about your humanness. And Timothy's humanness here, his sense of having this spirit of fear, is, is something that I think that, that, that Satan and, uh, and, and those of us in the ministry and in life, sometimes your own humanness, your own human weakness, your own sense of inferiority or your frailties or your lackings sometimes can be discouraging to you. And that tender heart is, is an important thing, but it's always governed by the, by the truth of sound doctrine and the truth. That, uh, that is to, to gird up the loins of your mind and your thinking and your thought process. So he, he draws some things from, from their past. Then he says in verse 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That that issue of fear, that, that issue of being ashamed, Webster's 828 Dictionary defines ashamed as a low opinion confused with a sense of inferiorness. Or inferiority. It's the idea of, of thinking about things and, and, and developing a low opinion of something, not holding it in its value or giving it its right or proper place. Um, and, and Timothy, I think at this point, is, is struggling and he's tired of the struggle. He's tired. He's, he's growing weary in well-doing. And perhaps he's struggling with his own sense of, um, this thing about spirit of fear. Go back to um, go back to Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight. The, the spirit of fear. There's phraseology real similar to this back here that um, has really helped me in uh, in much of my life and uh, and in ministry life and family life. Back here in Romans chapter eight, Paul is talking about as you know is walking in the spirit and uh, the issue of the power of the spirit of God in our life as as opposed to the issue of the flesh. And he says in verse fifteen. He says, for, we have not, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby ye cry, Abba, we cry, Abba, Father. That, that spirit of fear, that spirit of bondage, doesn't that take you right back to Romans 7? Where he talks about the, 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 the spirit, we, we serve now in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What does the law do? The law condemns. 
And oftentimes you put yourself under a performance system. You put yourself under a performance mentality and you begin to think about yourself in relationship to others or you think about your ministry in relationship to other people's ministry. And I know as I you know, go back to the times thinking about uh, making the decision to, uh, to go into the ministry, there was many times I sat there and I thought, I'm never going to be like so-and-so. I can never... I, you know, I, I, I admired several of the men that I had, had had experiences with. And what, what, what is that? That's just putting yourself under a performance type. It's, it's the if-then. If I can't do it like that, then I shouldn't, try to, I shouldn't let the Lord work in my life. And that spirit of bondage, again, to fear, that, that legalistic spirit of, uh, of, of, of self-awareness. In Romans chapter 7, it's, it's all about I and me and I and becoming self-conscious and, and, and the pity party. You know, the, uh, the, oh, woe is me kind of thing. And we all have those things in life. And uh, we all come to, to points in times where we just get tired of the person in the mirror. And we feel like, uh, you know, we, we're just, uh, you know, just never going to measure up and never going to make the grade. And we have, that little, uh, that, we have that little emotional snit. I remember back in 1985, I had, uh, I think it was 85, maybe it was 86, I, I had taken the church there in Genoa City and began to uh, uh, manage the affairs there. And we had two, yeah, we didn't, Kurt and Kyle weren't even thought of yet. We had Amy and Lisa, two little kids, and uh, the work of the ministry. And I was, I was still working at the time and uh, be, become, became overwhelmed, still finishing, still going through the school at the same time and working 40 hours. I had a lot on my plate. <laughs> and I remember coming to a point and just walking out the back door at that parsonage there in Genoa City and sitting down there and says, man... I just, you know, where, where do I go? You know, I just, I, I, I was just overwhelmed by all that. I remember walking out and, and walking down the driveway and coming to the end of the driveway and then walking down the hill and, and, and sitting in the weeds and just saying, man, is this really what I, what I signed up for? Maybe I shouldn't have. You know, and all of a sudden, you know, it dawned on me, you know, I'd thought myself into that, that frame of mind and feeling sorry for myself and say, you know, what in the world, you know, Get up and clean your act up like a man and, you know, be the man you're supposed to be, you know. And, and, but, but what is all of that? That's all looking at I and me and my. And, and I don't know if Timothy is consumed with himself, but he's surely being overwhelmed and, and somewhat discouraged by the situation and the circumstances. And he's just ready to quit. And that's what discouragement does. And Timothy has, has reached that point, I believe. And he's tired of the struggle. And in the ministry, sometimes we get tired and of, the, uh, of the struggle. We get tired of the opposition. We get tired of the ridicule or the, or the criticism or the disdain or, or being misunderstood. When these truths mean so much to us and, and they, they, they minister to our hearts and they have a tremendous impact in our lives, but we're not seeing the fruit in the lives of others. And it's just real easy to, to become down in the dumps and... Uh, Coming to a point where you just want to, you know, you just want to let somebody else do it. I don't know if you ever felt like that, but uh, it, it's the natural thing sometimes. And we have the self-doubt and the things. And, and Timothy, Paul is here and he says, here's what I want you to do. He appeals to Timothy's mind. He starts there in verse number 6. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance, Timothy. Remember some things. Start thinking. Start thinking, Timothy, about, about your, your upbringing and, and your mama and your grandmother and, and, and your, your young life in ministry. Begin to think about those things and don't have... He says, God hasn't given us the spirit of fear. A, a, a worrying about what other people think or worrying about uh, uh, acceptance and, uh, and that, that, that spirit of fear and that spirit of weakness and being intimidated and being beat down. And that's that spirit of weakness. He says, Timothy, God hasn't given us that spirit of fear. And I don't know where you're at this evening. I don't know if you've, if you've struggled with things in your personal life or your ministerial life or, or just life in general. Discouragement, depression, um, whatever. But there's a, there's, Paul appeals to Timothy here about some things. That um, he, he puts Timothy in remembrance and he, he's challenging Timothy to, to stir up some things. 
to be refreshed, to be renewed, to put off this, this, being, this, this looking at the circumstances and looking at yourself or looking at the things that are discouraging you and focus on, on the truth of God's Word and focus on the ministry and focus on what God has given you to do. That's that spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And he says, to, he says God hasn't, hasn't given us the spirit of fear. This, this idea of being intimidated, the idea of overly being consumed about what people think of you or what people think of your ministry or comparing yourself with, with others or comparing yourself among yourselves. He says the answer to all of that is not this spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And he's challenging Timothy to take the truth of the God's Word and to stir that truth up and to, and to renew the passion and to renew the fire and to renew the zeal. And you know how you do that? You believe the doctrine. You don't just know the truth and give mental assent to it, but you have to constantly renew your mind and renew that truth in your heart and, and not just know the doctrine, but believe the doctrine. And in spite of how I feel and in spite of how things look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a conscious decision to walk by faith and the truth of God's Word. And that's what's going to be my reality. And act upon that. And the answer is a sound mind. And my desire is not to preach the, 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 the brethren's message later on. But he says in verse number, number 8, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me his prisoner. Don't be ashamed. Don't be weak. What's he say over in chapter 2? Verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. See, it's not about you, <laughs> Timothy. It's not about you. It's about the message. About, it's about the grace and the position you have in Jesus Christ. Not the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption. You're a full-grown adult son participating in the glory program of God. Believe that. You've already got the victory. You're on the winning side. Just act upon it and live on that basis. And he, he tells him here to stir some things up. And I'm going to say some things in the remainder time here out of verse number 6. He gives, Timothy, he gives Timothy three things here. He says, Wherefore I put thee, verse 6, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. Now, first and foremost, the, the verse there is talking about the ministry that was committed unto him by the laying out of the hands of the presbytery back in chapter 5. He's talking about the, the, the message that was committed to his trust. But can I say something else to you? I guess I can because I'm up here and got the open Bible and the, got the floor for the time being. I'll sh share with you something. There's something else that's inside of you. There's something else in the Bible that's called the gift of God that sometimes we need to stir up. The gift of God is what? In Romans 6.23? Eternal life. Amen. The issue of our salvation, first and foremost. Can I tell you that when you get discouraged in the work of the ministry, and sometimes you're, you're struggling because you're always trying to reach that, that churchy, churchianity person, that denominational person, or that person stuck in the religious system and they need help, and God would have all men to come into the knowledge of the truth, and, and they need our ministry, and we proclaim the Word of God rightly divided. But one of the greatest things that you'll do in your life is give, pay attention to and stir up your own salvation by getting involved in personal work and evangelism. Your own personal ambassadorship as a, as a minister of the gospel of salvation to lost people will do a great deal for you in your personal life and in your walk with the Lord. You know, if you can't reach some people that are already mired in the tradition, go reach somebody... That'll, that'll appreciate the fact that their sins are forgiven and they'll want you to teach them because you brought them out of all of that from scratch. Amen? I told you that story back in 1985. You know what happened shortly after that? It was, uh, um, got a phone call from a guy who I had taken a gospel tract to Lake Geneva to have a, a couple of gospel tracts printed up. His brother John Westmus, he wasn't my brother then. But he, he was working in the print shop <laughs> and, and uh, he read that track and he was teaching a, a Sunday school class in a denominational church and some kids, some fifth or sixth grade boys had asked him a question about the sheep and the goats. What are the sheep and the goats in the Bible? John said, I didn't know what the sheep and the goats were. 
But he had this, he had this gospel track in front of him with my name and address on it that I had sent in there to, to, to print, had printed up. He says, here's the phone number. I'll call this guy. Maybe he can help me. <laughs> and we met at McDonald's there in Lake Geneva. And I answered his question about the sheep and the goats. That didn't take long. And then I led him to the Lord. And what a great... He was, it was like falling off a log. Took him... You ask him, ask him the story. He wrote his own track about, about what do you mean, lake of fire. I took him and I dangled him over Revelation 21 verse 8 about every liar having a part in, in, the, in the lake which burned the fire and brimstone. And he got saved that night. And what a thrill that was. And I, I said, this is what, it, this is what we, we focus on. And the issue of, of doing the work of the ministry and sharing the gospel with people. And sometimes we forget that or we neglect that or we, 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 we set that aside or don't put it on, on the front burner as we should have. And so it, in the issue of personal work in your own life, do the work of an evangelist. Be thinking about those things. There's no greater joy in life. We had a, we had a fellow who, um, a new, new fellow in our ministry who is... Uh, um, come through our seven-hour study and growing in the in things of the Lord. And he asked me to go talk to his mom. And we went down and visited with his mom. And his mom got saved. Then he asked me to talk to his daughter. His daughter was already saved because I believe that she, he, she, he shared the gospel with her. But what a great thing to sit across a table from somebody with an open Bible and watch them pass from death unto life and, and see the smile come on their face and to know that they're forgiven. And you ask them the question back and they say, Yeah, I know I'm going to heaven because Christ died for my sins. And you're, on, you, you, you know, you're, you're, you're like back to the future. <laughs> Your car doesn't even touch the ground on the way home. <laughs> you know, great thing. Do the work. And, and he tells him that later on in the book, doesn't he? And when he says, preach the word, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Personal work. Valuable, important things. But then he also says here that thou, verse 6, so that's, that's all commercial, okay? That's just something that from me to you, that has meant a lot to me in my life. But verse number 6, he says, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. There's the, there's the, the ministry that was committed to him. And um, if you go back, to, um, go back to chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 14, that issue of the laying on of hands... That was the, the, I believe that that's the commissioning of ministry as we would, we would say or, the ordination process. There came a point in time where Timothy, Timothy's ministry was recognized and Timothy was commended by a group of men to, to either labor with Paul or, or minister on his own. He says, 1 Timothy 4 verse 14, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying out of the hands of the presbytery. He, he takes Timothy back to that point in time with some men that, that uh, commended Timothy. Can I, can I say to you that one of the most important things is having, having godly men around you. Men that you're accountable to. Men you, that you're responsible to. Men that, 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 that you have... That, that, that i got to say this right. They have your ear. No. <laughs> you have... Yeah, they have your ear. <laughs> They will, they, you listen to their advice and, and the accountability and the, the, the issue of the brethren and other men to, to gain encouragement from, whether it's in your local assembly, um, the, the, the men that you serve with, or the, the men that you, that you know in your, in your local circle of fellowship, you gain encouragement and, and support. You have accountability. You can gain counsel and wisdom from them. Oftentimes they see things maybe in a way that you don't, don't always see. You know, you're not always right. You get these grand ideas and things that you want to do, you know. And uh, sometimes it's important to bounce those things off of other people. And they can, then maybe it's a good idea. Maybe they've got an angle that will help you make it even better. But the idea of listening and, and having the ear... Uh, and, and giving heed to some other individuals that can help you and being accountable locally. I can't tell you how valuable that has been to me through the years. As I became the pastor in Genoa City, I was just this, this young guy. I was pastoring people that, 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 that watched me grow up. And it was very humbling to try to function as a young man to some pastors, as a pastor to some people who had... Change my diapers, you know, that kind of thing. 
<laughs> but you know, it, it gives you a sense of humility to learn to work with other people and to respect their opinions, even if they, you might not always agree with their perspective. You've always got something that you can learn from them. And rather than getting angry when you have opposition or getting angry when, 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 when there's criticism, look for the value in it. Look for the truth in it. Because very seldom are, are people 100% wrong. Maybe they're 90% wrong. But even if they're 90% wrong, won't the 10% that they're right help you? And if we get defensive and we get, get, uh, get, get thin-skinned and react uh, inappropriately, we lose the value that's one of the greatest things in the ministry is learning to be accountable to other individuals. Your wife, for example, oftentimes sees things that you don't see. And you better listen, guys. Because <laughs> half, if you're fortunate, half of your congregation or a certain percentage of your congregation are women. And uh, you, need to, you need to minister to them too. And uh, it, it's, it's wonderful to have counsel. And to have other individuals around you that see things that you don't see and that can give you counsel and encouragement. And learning to submit yourself, not to be their doormat, but to be their, their co-minister and helpers together of their joy. And, and investing in the ministry that way. There's a great, great value in that. And, if, and uh, it, sometimes you may even have to eat a little humble pie along the way. And that's a good thing. <laughs> That's a good thing. You need a little dose of that once in a while. You know, Paul says, I serving the Lord with all humility of mind. He says, I'm less than the least of all saints. That, uh, that, that, that humble spirit in the work of the ministry is, is valuable. The broader fellowship. The, the broader fellowship of the, of the, uh, of the, 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 the network that we, that we enjoy the friends and, and associates uh, in other parts of the country, in other parts of the world. There's a great value in, in the broader aspect of our fellowship when it comes to the issues of doctrine and truth. How many times have we seen through the years, those of us that have been around, somebody that has a new perspective on, on truth or a, a different angle on a verse or a different angle here or, or there, and, and all of a sudden begin to proclaim that and go off on their own and, and have this wonderful revelation, you know. But never take their, their, their idea or their truth and subject it to others Amen. and peer review in things. You know, you'll never find a group of men anywhere that are more open to listen. If you've got some new light on a verse, if you've got, and a lot of times though, new truth, supposed new truth is just recycled old error. But, you know, without the accountability and without the broader fellowship and living in conscious of that, oftentimes individuals with their own independent spirit go off and they want to be their own little king in their own little kingdom. <laughs> and there's value in the broader fellowship and the interaction in peer review of doctrine and truth and things. And if you've got some new light, you'll, you'll never find a group of individuals that are going to be more desirous to learn and to grow. Isn't it wonderful how, how we have grown through the years and progressed in, in areas of truth? And I hope the generation coming behind us doesn't look back and, and, and look, at the, look at the men from the 80s and the 90s and, and the 2000s and so on, the, the, the generation that, that uh, were raised up through the ministry of the Great School of the Bible, and just, just pat them on the back and say, wow, we're, we're looking, we appreciate those guys. I hope that this new generation goes forward and goes on and, and pr presses the issue of truth and, and covers new ground, but do it together. Together, Amen. don't go out and try to do it in, your, in, 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 in an island. Have men in your own local church that, that you train and you raise up, and and uh, and, and you're, you're, you you let them learn the truth with you and bring them with you, and heed their counsel and and take their admonishment and fine tune the truth or jettison the truth, the, the error. I shouldn't say you never jettison the truth. <laughs> But you know, if it, doesn't, if it doesn't cut the mustard, you don't want it. It's just dead weight. And Timothy has appealed, uh, Paul appeals to the, the, stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting out of my hands. I, I, I read that and I think about the brethren. I think about the, the local fellowship and the broader fellowship 
the, the keeping on, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Lean on, lean on your friends and other men and be accountable to that. The gift of God that is in you, your salvation, the truth and the ministry that was committed unto you and, and, uh, and, and fellowship with other men and be accountable to other men and, and go forward together in the truth. And then he says, um, by the, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That, that issue of spirit, I would remind you about the ambassadorship truths and the, the spirit and the soul and the body. The issue of the mind and the, and the, the intellect and where, where, where the spirit of God connects with our spirit and, and the truth of God is, is assimilated there and understood. And then it's eventually you know, brought down into the soul and believed and, and becomes part of who you are. But that issue of the spirit of fear and the believer's mind. I'm, again, I'm not going to preach the other message. But, but there's, there's something touching here in 2 Timothy and in two other epistles. The way Paul closes this book. And, uh, and closes two of, of, of his other epistles. That's very touching to me. Let me, let me go with you to, um, um, or go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. The book of 2 Timothy ends, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 22. It's a, it's a wonderful verse to, to put in context of the issues that Timothy is facing in, in 2 Timothy and the challenge that, that Paul is making to him to be strong and the, the perilous times in the latter days and to continue and to preach the Word and to, and to press for, you know, for the mark and do the work of an evangelist and all of those things. So 2 Timothy 4 verse 22, The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy what? spirit. Isn't that different? Then the spirit of fear and the self-consciousness or the world consciousness or the religious consciousness or whatever it is that, got, that is causing you to be, become discouraged. The answer to discouragement and the spirit of fear and intimidation is Jesus Christ and who we are in Him sons of God and ambassadors for Jesus Christ and complete in Him and blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places and always abounding in the work of the Lord and have the victory in Christ Jesus. Let the Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Not the spirit of fear. That's the answer to discouragement. When, when life and, and, uh, and things cause you to, to second guess, the Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Your mind, that, that sound mind and thinking, that's the answer. Jesus Christ is the answer to discouragement and the improper thinking. Come with me, if you would, to the book of Galatians. Here's another passage, another book that ends the same way. Different issue, though, as Paul is writing to the Galatians. Galatians chapter number 6. You know the issue in Galatians is Paul's gospel. And the distinctiveness of his message. And, and people have departed from it. And Paul is instructing them about, about, about returning to the, to the issues of the truth and the authority of his apostleship. And he says in Ephesians chapter, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 18. Brethren, and isn't that interesting? I, that's something I noticed years ago. You, you go back to the very first part of the book of Galatians. It's not the, the church of Galatia. Galatia wasn't a city, was it? Galatians, Galatia was a region. Here he's writing to a, a group of churches, if you will. Brethren, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your what? spirit. Your mind and your thinking. The answer to false doctrine and being led away from the truths of the gospel of the grace of God and legalism is what? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Spirit, not the spirit of bondage, again to fear, truth of God's word. So the, the issue of a, of a sound mind is the answer to discouragement. It's the answer to bad doctrine and legalism. The other place is the book of Philemon. Go there with me. Philemon and verse number 15. You know the story in the book of Philemon. The end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. And Philemon has to put the truth into practice that he's been proclaiming, the issue of, of charity and, and godliness and grace in your life. And in the back door, there walks Onesimus. 
And all of a sudden, Philemon has to practice what he preaches. And Paul lays out the challenge. You know the story here in the book of Philemon. He says in verse 15, All that are with me salute thee. Greet them that love us in the faith. Oh, wait a minute. I'm reaching. Um, I got Philemon, but I'm reading the end of um, the end of Titus. <laughs> Thank you. You don't get away with messing around with the verses in this crowd. Philemon verse 25. There we go. That's where I want to be. Philemon verse 25. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. You know what the answer is in damaged relationships, hurt feelings, strife, contention between the brethren, difficulty in your home life, in your family, problems that maybe arise between you and another family member? You know, this gets right down to where we live, isn't it? The answer to struggles in personal relationships is what? His grace is sufficient, isn't it? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. He'll enable you to do the right thing. When everything in your mind and heart is telling you to do, in your, you want to react in the flesh, when it comes to a, a difficult relationship with a brother or a sister or, or somebody close to you in your life, you know what the answer is? Not the spirit of fear, not the spirit of bondage, not the spirit of striking out and striking back and get even and how dare you say that to me and how dare you, you know... I'm going to give you a piece of my mind that I can't afford to lose. <laughs> no, the answer is a spirit of grace. Of taking the issue of grace and God's grace that, that took us as an enemy, as somebody who is ungodly, who is somebody without strength, who dispensationally was on the other side of that middle wall of partition and opened up the... the the, the glories of, of the heavenly places and the richness of life in Christ and made you rich beyond your wildest dreams and made you rich eternally and, and made you a joint heir with His own beloved Son. God did that for you, His enemy. Can't you put on grace? And like Ephesians says, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. You know how you do that? You do that not on an, an emotional level, you do that with your mind choosing to function on the truth of God's Word. Amen? And that's the answer, to always be abounding in the work of the Lord. Amen? Amen? Father, we thank You for Your goodness and Your grace. We thank You for our life in Christ Jesus and the ministry we share. And we thank You for this weekend, and we look forward to being refreshed and uh, re being renewed and, and going away from this place with uh, uh, being stirred up to, uh, to do the work of the ministry. And we thank you for the fact that it will bear fruit not only in this world, but in the world to come. And there are so many great things at stake, Lord. Help us to, uh, to uh, keep that which is committed to our trust and to adorn the doctrine. And may the Lord Jesus Christ be seen in us day by day. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.